guys, welcome back for episode number 58, I believe, um, of the weekly playback. So I am recording using a webcam and a regular mic today. I thought I would try to upgrade my, uh, you know, video content. So we'll see. Let me know if this is better or worse than me recording on my cell phone. Um, up until now, I'd been recording on my cell phone. Uh, but for my top 10 video of 2022, I did record using this webcam and mic as well. I know I still need to work on the sound quality because there's a lot of echo still, I feel like. So I need to work on that and I will. Um, but yeah, let me know what you prefer, whether you prefer this webcam or if I should just go back to my phone. Um, but eventually I know I need to work on just upgrading everything. So and hopefully I will get to that slowly but surely. So let's talk about the games I played in the last week. It was like, I guess, a Rainer Knizia week. Well, I mean, two Rainer Knizia games. Um, so the first one I will talk about is uh, Mill Fiori. So Mill Fiori is a 2021 game. Let me just pull up the information. This is a 2021 game designed by uh, Rainer Knizia. The art is done by Stefan Lorenz and it's published by Schmidt Spiel. Um, I got this from De Vere, so I guess they're, you know, uh, De Vere has rights to distribute it. Um, and this is uh, an area majority influence game. It feels very much like an abstract game. So in this game, you're supposed to be glass makers and you want to be like the most celebrated glass maker by, um, let me just, what it says. It says make history by becoming the most renowned glassmaker on the Laguna di Venezia. Learn the secrets of your craft and build your trading network to secure the support of the lagoon's inhabitants. You'll need to blend bold strategy and clever tactics to make your fortune on the Mill Fiori. So there are different parts of this board and it is, you're going to, um, it's kind of like a, hmm. well first let me just show you the board. <laughs> so here is the board. And there are different parts of the board. So like here, this blue section is the harbor. Um, this, I don't remember what it's called. Um, here, it's like the neighborhood or whatever. And here, I don't remember what this area is called, but they all kind of score in different ways. Um, so you're going to have cards and then, um, well, I'll get into that in a bit, but these are the different sections of the board. And for me, it felt like a little bit like several different abstract games going on at once, <laughs> which was interesting. Um, so you're going to, oh, let me just show you some of the player pieces. So here are the various player pieces um, in different colors. This is purple, orange, green, and red. And then each player has a boat and then a score track marker. And then here are the various cards and you are going to be dealt a certain number of cards. And then on your turn, you will play a card and then, um, then you're so each person will choose which card they want to play on their turn and just put it face down and then sorry i think a lot of those might be upside down and then after everyone has played the card they want to you switch hands so you would play a card and then hand the rest of your hand to the other player so i played a two-player game of this so it was just going back and forth and you would do that for each round until i believe in a two-player game there were two cards left over and then the leftover cards would go in this like pool of face-up cards which you might be able to play uh grab one of those as a bonus card if you completed a bonus requirement on one of the areas of the board um so basically the different cards will also show you how different parts of the board score so like at the i don't know if i can get that to focus or but each card shows you like how the different areas will score. Um, so yeah. So I won't go into all the different scoring requirements, but it's a pretty cool game. So in the different areas, like in some of them you want adjacent tiles and some of them you want to have tiles, the most tiles in a row to score the most points. And some of them you need to make like, in one of them areas you need to make like a pyramid and then your opponent might, uh, other players who contributed to the pyramid would also be able to score certain points in the harbor, um, you know, depending on who has like the most. So after you've like filled up a row here, then if you have a tile here, you would get a certain number of points depending how many tiles you have. So there's like different things going on in all the different areas of the board. And in order to get like bonus cards, like up here, you would need to surround this little circle, like the symbol, 
in order to play a bonus card on your turn, which again would be in the open, like the pool of cards face up that you could just pick one from. So that's really nice because depending on which area of the board you might be focusing on, you might have a card that would really benefit you and you can chain kind of like turns in that way. You can kind of chain actions in if you end up triggering like another bonus or something. Um, in addition to that, in each area, the first person who gets like all of the different kinds of symbols will get a bonus and you'll get to place your tile on the highest value one. So in each section, there's like a 20, 15, 10, and five. So if you're the first person to get all four symbols in one area, you would get to put your tile there and score that many points. Um, but again, each area is different, um, so there might be different requirements. So in this one, it's actually three symbols. Here, it's like different numbers. So, you know, each area has something a bit different going on. So again, to me, it felt like a, you know, a number of different like abstract games in one. Um, and then in the end, you kind of just combine it. And um, So for scoring, we had pretty high scores in a two-player game. And in fact, we went around the score tracker like... You know, we both passed 200 and there's no way to indicate when you've passed 100. Um, so I don't know if, you know, that's the case in a higher player count game, but um, in our two player game, like we were like getting really high scores and we know we did everything correctly. Like we read the rule book time and time again, we referred back to it all the time. Um, yeah, so I think in a higher player count game, this would be way more competitive. Like you are going to be, I think, you know, you're not going to have as easy of a time getting those bonuses, I think, because other players might try to screw you over. Um, I think it'll be a lot more interesting in a higher player count game than a two player game. But in a two player game, it was still good, but I still think a, you know, a higher player count game would probably be more interesting and more competitive. And I definitely want to try it at a higher player count at some point. But again, it felt like, you know, multiple little abstract games in one big game. And I really liked it. I thought it was really, really good. And of course, it's really pretty and, you know, the components are really nice. I don't know if they're plastic or acrylic. I can't really tell what the difference is. Is acrylic plastic? I don't think they're the same thing. I really don't know. So the other Rainer Knizia game that I played is called Longboard. And this is a set collection game. So this is um, a 2022 game and the art is done by Tristan Rosin and it's published by 25th Century Games. The funny thing is, this is for two to four players. The funny thing is after we played this, so again, I played a two player game with this. After I played it, I didn't realized it was designed by Rainer Knizia. I didn't actually look at who designed it or anything before I started playing it. And after we played it, I said to my friend, I was like, God, how many set collection games do we need? Like, why did this person even design this? Like, unless they're like a huge surfing fan, like, was this game really necessary? There's just so many small box games. There was like an abundance of them. There was like, you know, the market is oversaturated with small box games. So unless like you're a super surfing fan, like, you know, a major surfing fan, then, you know, what was the point of like designing this game? And then my friend is like, what was the point of Rainer Knizia designing a game? And then I was like, oh, it's a Rainer Knizia game. <laughs> like I felt a bit like silly, um, but I guess the, my point still stands. Like it's, you know, it was a good game. It wasn't as amazing as I thought it was going to be because I remember reading someone's post on Instagram saying like, oh, it's such a great game. I didn't think it was that great. I thought it was good. I did not think it was like amazing. So in this game, you are trying to complete different surfboards. Um, so it's weird. Uh, the term for like a completed board is called shaped. So the game end depends on player count and how many shaped boards a player has and then one shaped board has to have at least seven cards and that's how the game end will be triggered um, and there are different objectives so basically you are going to have um, you know these different surfboard cards and the, as you can see they have different numbers and colors of course and on these cards you'll see stickers like these round things right so the different boards have different numbers of stickers some of them like even a couple of them even have three and then you have these wild cards cards that can be used with any board. So in order to complete a board, your numbers have to go in ascending order. They don't have to be in order order, like adjacency order. Like it doesn't have to be one, two, three, four, five, six. It can be like two, four, five, seven, as long as they're in ascending order. So on your turn, you have two actions you can use, but there are three actions available. So you can increase your supply, you can draw a card from the draw pile and add it to your supply. Your supply is going to be face up for everyone to see. Uh, on the table because people can trade with you. Another action you can take is to start or extend a board from your supply. 
Um, so you can either start a board or add to an existing board. Um, and of course they have to be the same color. So you can't have like orange and blue mixed together. Blue has to be blue, orange has to be blue and so on. Um, but of course wilds can be added to any board. And then the third action available is to swap a card and use it. So you can take a card from someone else, but you have to give them one or more cards that is greater than the value of the card that you took from them. So if you took a five from them, you would have to give them one or more cards totaling six or more. Um, so all colors have to be placed together. And again, you know, the game end trigger is depending on how many players there are. So in a two player game, uh, the game end was triggered when there were four shaped boards and one of which had to contain at least seven cards. And then for scoring, you are going to count up. So any boards that are not shaped, meaning they don't have at least four cards in them, you would get, I believe, I think you might even get negative points. Do you get negative points? No, I think you just don't count them. Um, maybe you do get negative. No, no, I don't think you get negative points. I think you just don't count them. So shaped boards consist of four more cards. Um, so then you would count up the stickers on those boards. So however many stickers you have on that board is how many points, you, you know, you would get. So you would total up the stickers for each board that is completed. And then in addition to that, um, Oh yeah, you do lose points. Boards containing only one card will lose two points. Boards containing two or three cards will lose one point. So yeah, so there were negative points actually. And then um, there's shop achievements. So five points are awarded to the player with the largest number of shaped boards. And then five points are awarded to the player with the longest shaped board. Um, and then you will look at the objective cards and get points for those. Um, so I'll just show you some examples of some objectives. So yeah, these are like some objective cards. So basically that's it. So, you know, there's three available actions. You're taking two actions on your turn and you're just creating surfboards. It's a set collection game. I didn't think it was anything like super extraordinary, which is why I was like, okay, yeah, it's a good game, but like, you know, how many of these do we need? But I guess, you know, um, you can say that about any game. And, you know, there's people who are like diehard Knizia fans who probably want every game that's designed by him. And so, yeah, so, <laughs> I mean, it would be nice to have that kind of, um, you know, of a reputation in something. So I'm sure, he, you know, he can decide whatever he wants and it will get published. So, yeah. Um, but for me, I, you know, it's an okay game. I don't know if I'll play it again. Maybe on a beach. Maybe if I go, like, I hate the beach, though. So I don't know when that will happen. I'm not a beach person. But maybe if someday I am on a beach again, I will take that game with me and play it there. So there we go. Um, so those were, oh, actually I played one more game. Um, so actually I played two more games, but the other game I will talk about is Machi Koro. So I played Machi Koro for the first time. That's a 2012 game designed by Masao Suganuma. Um, and the art is done by Noburu Hota, Ian Paravel, and Mirko Suzuki. Um, it's published by Pandasaurus Games, I believe. So this is like kind of like a dice rolling, kind of like city building game. Um, so you uh, have these cards that you're trying to buy and build into your own like little city and they have numbers on them. And depending on which number you roll, certain cards will activate and you might get money money which you need to then build more cards you might be able to steal money from an opponent and they might be able to steal money from you even on your own dice rolls um, and you might even get to be you know again taking money from someone else on their dice rolls um, so you're trying to add different cards to your city that have like different you know dice roll numbers on them so that hopefully every time something rolls you'll get something like that is kind of like you know how you are trying to get more and more money to build up your city at the beginning of the game each player is dealt these four cards which you have to build and the game end is triggered once someone has built all of those four cards but otherwise there's like you know a pool of cards that you can build from and there are you know some special cards that are the ones that will really allow you to like harm the other player by stealing money from them um yeah, it's a cute little game. It was a quick little game. Um, you know, there is one uh, card when you build it, then you can roll two dice instead of one. Um, but yeah, it's a cute game. I've never played it before. I thought it was cute. Um, you know, I would not feel compelled to add it to my collection, but if anyone ever wants to play it again, I would probably play it again. And then finally, the other game I played, again, was Azul Chocolate, but this time I lost very, very badly. But I've discussed that before, so I won't discuss it again. Um, so now I will go into games that I'm backing or not backing. So I actually canceled my pledge for Hollywood 1947. 
The reason I did that is because I am super duper broke at the moment. Like I have a lot of credit card debt. When Dobby was sick, his medical bills were extremely expensive. Like I racked up over $4,000 of credit card debt um, when he was in, the, in and out of the hospital in December um, and with his surgery. And I already had some credit card debt from before then. So a part of me was like, why am I giving into FOMO and this completionist like tendency I have of like completing a set of games when I haven't even played the other games in the series that I have. So I actually own all the previous games in the Facade series, um, but I've only played one of them. So what are the other ones? Let me just read on the Kickstarter page. So the other ones in the series are Salem 1692, I have not played, Tortuga 1667, I have not played, Deadwood 1876, I have not played, I have played Bristol 1350 just once, I thought it was okay. Um, so part of me, you know, the only reason I backed this game was Hollywood 1947 was because like I'm a completionist and someone from Bitewing Games said it's like the best social deduction game he's played. Um, what are the chances I'm actually going to play this and think it's the best social deduction game I've ever played? I think the chances, you know, I think the likelihood of that happening is pretty small. So I should be saving my money and not just throwing it away um, because $50 is a lot of money. Um, and I can't just keep on thinking, oh, $50, like I can do that. No, I should really just stop buying games that I'm not going to play and don't need. So I canceled my pledge. And in fact, I might just try to sell the rest of the games that I haven't played. Um, and, and including Bristol, just so I don't, you know, give into that completionist tendency, like, oh, I need all of them. Like, if I haven't played them now, and I've had Salem forever, like Salem and Tortuga and Deadwood, I've had those for many, many years, and they still have not been played. And the only reason Bristol got played was because one of my friends wanted to play it. He saw it on my shelf, and otherwise it probably wouldn't have gotten played either, to be honest. Um, so yeah, so I canceled my pledge for Hollywood 1947, and... The reason I did that as well is because there is another game that came onto Kickstarter that I really do want and I don't think I would be able to get a review copy of it because I reached out to the publisher twice and they just ignored me. So I don't think I'm going to ever get a review copy of it. So if I want this game, I think I need to back it. And that is Zuvadis from Bitewing Games. Um, so Zuvadis is a Rainer Knizia game that had come out, but it's been like rethemed and it's been updated. So it's a game for three to seven players. I think that there's like some kind of negotiation and stuff going on in this game. It, like from the description, it seems like a kind of game that I would really, really enjoy. And of course I love animals and I really like the artwork and everything about this game. Um, so I am backing it at the deluxe edition level, which is super expensive, $69 plus shipping. So I really wanted this. So I really had to cancel Hollywood 1947. And I'm going to try to sell my set of facade games and try to get some money from that. In fact, I'm going to try to sell a lot of things because I just have a lot of debt and I need to somehow pay it off. So, um, so yeah, I need to make, you know, once I, I still haven't unpacked all of my games, but I really need to start making some decisions about what to do because I just can't not you know keep on giving into FOMO and stuff but I am backing Zuvadis just because it looks really cool and again I don't think I'd be able to get a review copy of it so um just because I, th I think the publisher probably doesn't like me or he just I don't know he hasn't you know responded to any of my messages ever so <laughs> um so yeah so we will see um but the animal meeples look really adorable just super duper cute there's another game as well it's called Gussie Gorillas in the same campaign but I'm not getting that just because I'm like eh I probably don't need it. Like again, it's like a small box game and there's like a billion of them. I probably don't need it, so I'm not backing it. So those are the games that I am currently backing. And of course I'm backing Arborea at one euro or maybe it's pound, I think pound, um, just to get my production copy of that. And that is from Alley Cat Games. And I actually really did love Arborea, so uh, I would be looking forward to getting a production copy of that. Now let's go into the games that I received. Before I get into one that I'm super duper excited about, I will talk about one that I'm also excited about, but um, not as excited as the other one. <laughs> but yeah, Goblin Vault is a game that I am excited about. So this is from Thunderworks Games. It's designed by Keith Matejka and Eric Schlautman. Um, and this is part of the role player universe. Um, so it's a small box. I actually thought it was going to be a bigger box. I don't know why. Um, so I believe it's a kind of like a bidding game, I think. So yeah, um, that's the rule book. It comes with a score pad. Um, it comes with these player tokens. 
And then it comes with a bunch of different gears, gear, cardboard, gear tokens, and I think that's probably the first player marker or the other thing. And then it has some cards. So it's a pretty small box. It's like about the size of the cartographer's box. So here are some cards that are in this color. Maybe, maybe these are just character cards that you're playing. I don't know. Um, and then there are cards that are all green on the back. I don't know. Maybe you're bidding on these items. I'm not, exact, I'm not exactly sure how it plays, but um, here are some player aids, I think. And then there are these cards, which I don't know what they are because I haven't played it yet. But it seems like a small enough, easy enough game to learn. So I hope I can play it soon. Because it seems like a nice little game to play. So yeah, so that arrived. Um, so we just put that away. So again, nice little small box game. So I think it'll be easy enough to learn. What does it say on the back? It says, in the dark corners of Kolbak Prison, away from the prying eyes of the guards, you're likely to find inmates huddled together in secret playing a game of goblin vaults. Wager cards to win loot. Stash your loot wisely to earn gears. And I'm guessing the person with the most gears or points wins. Um, so that looks cute. Yeah, and it's, it also has a solo mode as well. So it's for one to five players. And that just came out. I think you can order it right now um, and get it delivered soon. So I think it's available in retail. Um, the other game that arrived that I'm super duper excited about is Scholars of the South Tigris. So if you watch my top 10 video of 2022, you will know that Wayfarers of the South Tigris was my number one game of 2022. And this just arrived yesterday. So I'm shooting this video on a Saturday. It arrived on a Friday. So I'm super duper excited about this. Um, so here is the rule book. And I, and, you know, I'm always super impressed. I mean, this is only the second review copy I've ever gotten um, from Sean Phillips, but like it feels like a full production copy game. Like it's just the quality is just amazing. Um, so yeah, here is a board. Comes with some player bags, which are nice in the different player colors. Here is an individual player board. And then here is a large main board. So similar to um, Wayfarers, it looks like, sorry, wrong side. It looks like that there are some guilds you can influence over here, but otherwise it looks quite different. Um, so in this game, I believe you have translators and stuff. Um, so let me just show you. So it does come with some cardboard coins. I actually have a production copy of Wayfarers on its way to me with the metal coins. So I'll probably play with the metal ones once that production copy arrives. Um, let me just show you. It has lots of dice. The dice are super duper cute. Love these cute dice. These are red and blue. And I have a bunch of white ones, which I believe are probably neutral. And purple, yellow, some. There's just a couple orange and green ones as well. Um, there are some different meeples and stuff in different colors. Red and yellow meeples. And there are these tokens in different player colors. So it looks like some like flag markers, maybe some books, some different kind of tokens. These look like they're supposed to be gold bars. And then some more meeples, white and blue. Um, and then we have cards. So let me see. Here is one set of cards. Well, actually, those are different. One second. Oh, there's like people on. OK, so here is one set of cards. Again, I, you know, I, I might be showing you solo cards. I don't know what I'm showing you because I haven't played it yet. <laughs> um, here are some cards which have like these little images on the back and then on this side again those might be solo cards i don't know um bum, bum, bum. Ah, they smell so good do, 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 do. i 
And then these, I think, are like individual player cards. So it looks like each player gets their own set of cards of some kind. And then we have these people cards. So you have different translators in this game. Um, so let me just show you. A lot of these cards are double-sided. So like these cards are double-sided. It's pretty cool. But you can see like the different languages that they speak on, on the cards. But then you flip them over and it's the same people but with like different backgrounds. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then we have do, 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 these cards. And then these look like, I don't know what these are. Are these player aids? I don't know. There's a lot of them, so I can't imagine that they're player aids because there's just so many of them. Maybe these are solo mode cards. I really don't know. And then these look like player aids, maybe. I don't know. So yeah, so that is it. Again, the production quality is amazing. I mean, it comes with this insert, super duper nice. Um, you know, for a, I won't call this a prototype because, you know, I don't think it's prototype, but it's like a pre-production, you know, game for review. And it's just really amazing quality. And I just cannot wait to play this. Maybe you'll see if my friend who's coming over in a bit wants to play this today. Uh, that would be super exciting. But um, I'm not sure exactly when it's hitting Kickstarter. Shem actually didn't mention the Kickstarter date yet. So I don't know if it's in February or March, actually. Um, but hopefully I will find out and let you guys know. And of course, you know, I once I play it, I will, of course, make my one or two minute overview video of it. And of course, I'll discuss it in a weekly playback and talk about the differences between this and Wayfarers of the South Tigris. Um, so yeah, I'm super duper excited to play it. So let me know if you have any questions about it and I will be happy to answer them. Um, so yeah, so I guess this was a quicker video. Um, so I know I've asked this question before, but I'm gonna ask it again because I really need more help. How do you overcome FOMO? Like I just really need to stop giving in and buying games because I really have to learn how to save money and I really need hopefully an additional source of income <laughs> so um you know i wish that there were i wish i were getting as many bookings as i used to back in like 2021 um so 2021 was a really good year for bookings but uh 2022 was not and i probably should have saved money um so uh you know for a rainy day but oh well um you know lessons learned so yeah let me know how you overcome fomo um if you have any tips for overcoming fomo i should probably go back and find the video where i asked this before because i'm pretty sure i've asked this before but it's very much relevant right now um and i feel like it will be relevant as more and more cool games start to come out i feel like you know luckily i'm not like you know there's games that i'm just not interested in luckily i'm not interested in those really big box games with like that are super duper miniature heavy so thankfully i'm not interested in games like that because there are a crap ton of them and i would go super broke if i were into games like that um luckily i'm like you know my desire to back games from game brewer has gone down like because i feel like they turn out games at such a high rate that i'm starting to question the quality of their games um not that i've played them but like um you know it's just like how many games can game brewer put out in a year i don't know so um you know their most recent game that's on kickstarter right now like trolls and princesses or something like that i just didn't even bother i was like yeah not interested not gonna look at it um, so yeah, but you know, maybe if someday I get the opportunity to play it, I will play it, but I'm not going to back it. But I really need to overcome my FOMO and stop spending money that I do not have. So yeah. Um, but yeah, please tell me what your tips are for overcoming FOMO and just not backing everything. That would really be really helpful. And uh, hopefully in next week, I will have some other games to talk about, some new games to talk about that have been sitting on my shelf of shame, which I should really play. I should really play games on my shelf of shame and stop spending money. So I will be working on that and I will be working on unpacking more of my games and hopefully start culling them as well. Um, I feel like I should really um, cull a lot of games at this point too. So, um, but I still haven't finished unpacking, so I still need to do that. So anyway, so thank you for watching and until next time, bye. bye.